Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Professor David Tizard and welcome to this final lecture in the political science course where today we will be looking at ethnicity, race and politics and how these goes to how these go together. We'll also be having a look at a couple of uh, academic articles from the literature and see what they say about the subject. Obviously, it's ve it's a very uh, emotional topic. It it's heightened and exacerbated by what's going on uh, in the United States at the moment and more broadly all around the world. And one of the reasons I'm doing this is to allow the discussion to take place and for to open avenues of communication where that can go on. Also, uh, I want to have a look and see what the field that we're set, we're studying says about that issue and see if we can learn anything. Um, I've done similar things in my world history class where we look at the history of the, uh, the Civil War and the end of slavery, the civil rights movement in the mid 1960s, uh, the riots in 92 to try and give a historical perspective. In a similar way, I, I'm doing this topic in a hope that it might give you tools knowledge to either understand the world or to do what with it you please um let's have a look at what we have uh, if anybody knows what this uh opening picture is from uh four points to you this is a picture taken in south africa 1994 where elections were open it was the end of apartheid it was the end of segregation a very important and pivotal moment for that nation because the broader uh, view you have it, it's very easy to get caught up in the maelstrom and the zeitgeist and think that issues uh, only occur in one place because that's where the media uh, is focused or that's where the perceived powerful countries are but sometimes if we open our eyes we might see these issues all around us they just don't get the traction in the media or they don't uh, bring up the same emotive response in us. Now, um, I want to start with some statistics. Um, and, and these you, you find lots of statistics on the Internet. So I'm not saying that uh, these statistics are the demonstrable truth. They come from the BBC and the Pew Research Center. So th th that doesn't mean they're foolproof, but they have some validity perhaps more than a blog let's say um this first one asks whether race and ethnic groups should be considered uh in admissions to universities in the united states this was conducted uh 2019 so should uh, race be a factor in college admissions decisions there was a big uh call it a scandal a brouhaha related to harvard's admissions uh, and how it was trying to control them uh, that was a big thing last year now what you notice here is should race be a decision um the the white respondents said that it shouldn't be a factor uh, they were the they thought it was the least important uh the blacks and the hispanics fairly similar but more than the whites and then the Asians wanted race to be more of a factor so you get this idea that there is some difference and what you'll notice is that on certain topics sometimes the the ethnicities or the racial groups they will have similar opinions sometimes they will have different opinions here we get a slight difference so the, the white groups are arguing for more of a colorblind perspective uh, and these ones are arguing for more of a color conscious perspective. Uh, you'll see that in the uh, Republican Democrat. So if you're right wing, if you're Bosu Dang, this is more colorblind. Please don't pay attention to race and, and this is more color conscious. Let's be aware of it. Notice that these were still under 50 percent, all of these anyway. Um, in 2018 vote, um, did you, in the 2018 vote, uh, as reported by CNN, uh, who did you vote for, the Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate? So you can see that men are pretty much divided 50-50. Women lean more to the left in America. So the men are divided 50-50, but the women lean more sort of 60 40 towards the democratic side now that's perhaps quite natural if you were to um 
ask somebody what the the gender ratios would be that's probably what you expect and that might be what you get in other countries as well it would be interesting to look into why is that and is that a predictable thing will that always be the way or can that change will it ever be a situation where men vote predominantly more for one party than the other and women are more equal or not um the biggest difference is here though look while these were fairly similar the majority of uh uh white blacks hispanics and asians on this table all saying that race should not be a factor so the majorities there are the same here it's very different so again the white is fairly evenly split but leaning slightly towards the republican but the black is way and beyond towards the democratic 10 to 1 uh, as well as with the hispanics and the asians slightly less so sort of three quarters to one but that's still that that's a huge uh difference so it does play a role in the results of society and, and political elections and and voting um in this one whether people voted for trump clinton or no answer here you can see again as we like what the bbc re was reporting that uh white people are majority in their majority voting for the republican or the conservative candidate and blacks largely voting for the democratic candidate in hillary clinton and uh, hispanic and asians still voting in the majority for the democratic but less so so there is it would seem just looking at a couple of bits of data like this on certain issues there is consensus or in certain issues there's very big there's similarities when you address certain issues and that would be the important thing to to find out what issues the great divide is on because there are as you can see great divides it's not necessarily on something like this and probably you could pick other topics where they would be similar and other topics where they would be far removed um it, in looking at voter turnout from 1990 this is again from pew research uh 1990 to 2018 in looking at voter turnout over the past um three decades almost what you'll notice here is that yet yeah, there is a difference between them there is a greater voter turnout amongst the white rather than the black and the hispanic and the asians by the way these terms um they're the terms used here um, i'm using them fully aware that they might be problematic for some people or how are they defined or I, I'm completely aware of that uh, just for conversation here I'm going with the vocabulary uh, that is placed uh, in front of me in the literature so what I find interesting about this however is while there are gaps yes they seem to move together what I mean by that is that at this part uh, in 1990 th they all started dropping together and they maintained a similar level and they all dropped in 2014 the gap between them was similar here yes the blacks of uh the black uh voting population have risen up to be with only five of that but then they've all risen here so while there are differences between them they seem to be going up and down at similar points not exactly the same but there seems to be a similarity so broader societal um events are affecting everybody similarly there was this idea that everybody in 2014 is less interested in politics than they were in 2018 there's been a sharp jump before the midterm elections so you might want to consider well they seem to be reacting similarly there that doesn't mean they're going to be doing it with the same motivations for example with the current uh, protests centered around the the tragic death of George Floyd and everything else that has come since then that might drive up voting turnout equally amongst all of these um, categories but they might not all be voting for the same people obviously they, they might be because of uh, their different attitudes and what they see in the media and how they perceive these things it's becoming more and more polarized it might drive more people to the ballot boxes 
but for different results or for different to vote for different parties. Now, you might say, well, isn't that a good thing? Because really, we want 100 percent of participation in democracy. That that would be ideal, wouldn't it? If everybody, one man, one vote will come to that idea, I think one man, one vote, everybody votes and then that's it. It it would be problematic if one part of the population were voting like 100 percent, but others were not voting, that would be more problematic. What we see here instead, however, is that uh, the groups seem to be affected equally, at least according to this. Other research might suggest otherwise. Um, I just want to have a look at the um, results in Britain. So in Britain, we have a lot more political parties to choose from. We still have Conservative and Labour. They're the main ones, but the Liberal Democrats um, they had a coalition with the Conservatives in oh, 2010, I believe, with David Cameron and Nick Clegg. Um, and then you have other sort of minority parties. UKIP is a sort of far right, very right, extreme right, far right nationalist party uh, that's high on immigration and, and Brexit and things like that. Green parties, Scottish National Party uh, and so on. And just to have a look at these um by ethnic background with Asian, black and mixed race, the minorities here, which is what they're described as the ethnic minorities, they all voted for the Labour government. So there is a vote for left wing. The We can see that there might be similarities, at least between the UK and the US in this, that um, if you are a ethnic minority in a state, you might be more inclined to vote for the left wing. Now, why might that be? This is where I would ask you in class to you know, come up with some ideas. Well, but perhaps because uh, in from a Western political paradigm, the left wing would be more open to uh, social security, social benefits and financial uh, help and aid and support. And these people might need that more than others because of systemic uh, hardships that they face in society. Also because of more welcoming attitudes, perhaps, to globalization and multiculturalism uh, and open borders and such forth. Also, there might be a history related to it in that particular country where one party is the the supporter of the working class and, uh, and people mix there. There is... The the Asian uh, ethnic minority in the United Kingdom did vote more for the Conservative Party uh, than the black or mixed race. So there is there is a slight difference if you want to get into them. They those two look rather different. And so it would be interesting to consider um, what is it that attracts. Not half, it, it's just short of half. What is it that attracts just short of half of the. Uh, Asian ethnic minority in Britain to vote for the Conservative Party, what would it be driving that? And again, this is um, a, a vote of or a survey of 1,566. So it's a really small representation of the population. So there might be other st statistics out there that suggest different things. Um, so I'm not saying that these are exactly uh, gospel, but just to trying to bring up the discussion and ideas. Uh, I want to start by having a, a look at some of the ideas in this paper. This is The Centrality of Race in American Politics by Vincent L. Hutchins and Nicholas A. Uh, Valentino. Both political scientists, both have written um, a number of books and have cited uh, work in the academic field and in the literature. Y you can find it online if you need a copy, please ask me, but you should be able to access it through our university database and such forth. The Centrality of Race in American Politics, 2004, in the Annual Review of Political Science. They say, the discipline of political science in the United States has a peculiar history regarding the study of race and racial attitudes. Paralleling our nation's history, at times the role of race in politics seems minimal, whereas at other moments concern over race seems to pervade every nearly every discussion of institutions, elite behaviour and mass opinion. At the beginning of the 20th century, questions of the role of race in national, state or local politics received scarcely any attention in major political science journals. 
This occurred even as the states of the former Confederacy, Confederacy cemented into place the destructive doctrine of Jim Crow. Myrtle's groundbreaking treaty on the fundamental cleavages of race in America and the danger those cleavages pose for the long-term stability of our democracy received fairly little attention in the war-torn decade in which it was published. In the 1960s, race captured the attention of the discipline and of the whole country as a result of the civil rights movement. As our nation's cities convulsed with violence, citizens and elites were forced to directly confront the nature of race in American politics. The scholarly and popular consensus at the time was quite straightforward. Myrtle's American dilemma was far from resolved. The introduction here seems to suggest the same thing that we saw in that Pew data where it looks at voter turnout um, over three decades, for example. Obviously, this introduction goes back and looks at the end of the Civil War, which uh, legally and technically gave uh, ended slavery uh, and allowed less discrimination in American society. However, despite that, southern states, some southern states still used Jim Crow laws and such forth to uh, keep people down. And it required the 1960s movement of the Civil Rights Act to, to bring that once up again. The point that I'm making here is that the, the nature of race is what's suggested here is that it becomes an important thing and then it drops in importance and then it becomes important again and then it drops in importance and there will be specific events or there will be things that bring that to the to the mainstream to the consciousness and per perhaps that will continue happening until the issue of race is resolved if the if issue of race can be resolved like this it, it's a very um difficult situation but I'm sure we could all perceive how we would like the issue of race to be resolved. But until that is settled, perhaps it's going to go up and down. In the 1960s, many uh, dissident writers in the United States, such as Susan Sontag, said that she didn't see it ever happening. She thought it was a, uh, a deeply racist country and that it wouldn't really come to terms with it. There would just be these kind of uh, uh, swells every once in a while. But that fundamental change would be very difficult. It might perhaps be sort of like we get capitalist crashes and you know we, we think it's the result of bankers or, or bad people, but it might be just something inherent in the system that everyone is in, once in a while, there's this huge crash in the economic capitalist system and they seem to come with uh, like tremors in earthquakes. It, it might be similar uh, to this. Will it keep going up and down or will it stay at the top and be a race conscious society more? Or will it drop down again? Um, I missed the bottom. <clears throat> we began this inquiry by positing that the inequalities of citizen participation characteristics of every democracy become a source of content to the extent that the politically inactive both differ from partis participant groups in ways that are germane to politics and do not freely choose their political crescents. Clearly, Latinos, African Americans and Anglo whites are politically relevant groups. Ample evidence demonstrates the distinctiveness of their political concerns, needs, attitudes and behaviours. Hence, by the first comparison criterion, disparities in political activity potentially compromise democratic equality. So if there, if there is different amounts of voter turnout, if one group was voting 90% and another group was voting 20%, that would, the authors suggest, compromise democracy. That wouldn't be what is necessary. So they're trying to, that's one of the justifications for their uh, work. In terms of their methodology or what's been happening in political science regards, regarding sort of voting and ethnicity, they say that um, in 2004 when they were writing, a lot of the work was flawed. The methodology was flawed and it didn't produce the correct answers. They say that because... Uh, the studies didn't combine answers. They they often focus just on one group, the, the role of uh, Hispanics or Latinos in American politics or the, the, the black vote or African-American vote in American politics or the white. But it wasn't all encompassing. It didn't put them all together. They were separate and not talking to each other and, and not communicating with each other. That was uh, one of the things that they were hoping would go forward that... 
um, trying to bring them more together. Not the people themselves, but the studies. Bring the studies together. Now, that might be a controversial thing, uh, because if you put comparisons next to each other, um, a lot of people might suggest that there's well, we're not allowed to compare or contrast because the, the results or the answers might be um, not correct or they might be motivated by intrinsic bias or unconscious bias. Who is going to do this study? Do we need one person from every ethnicity to do the study? Well, in terms of science, science shouldn't be, science should not really uh, depend on who does it. Science is a process rather than uh, an interpretive thing. It's um, quantitative rather than qualitative. So it, there's not meant to be interpretation like you get in philosophy, like you get in history. The science aspect is meant to remove the bias. So the the authors of this paper are aware of that and they advocate for more or they champion a more uh, cohesive uh, field of literature. They say gaps in voting behaviour also occur across the full range of campaigns and have been typically quite large. Since 1936, when a majority of blacks first supported a Democrat for president, African Americans have been a mainstay of the National Democratic Party's electoral coalition. After the civil rights period polarised and solidified the party's stands on issues affecting African Americans, black support for the Democratic Party at all levels of government grew further. Democratic partisan identification among blacks doubled between 1960 and 1968, and now exceeds that whites by 30 percentage points or more. In 2000, only 44% of whites identified themselves as Democrats, whereas 82% of blacks did so. In addition, participation rates among blacks jumped dramatically after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 elim eliminated institutional obstacles. Meanwhile, pluralities of whites have supported Republicans in 10 out of 11 presidential elections since 1960. In 2000, George W. Bush received the support of a mere 8% of black voters, but a majority 54% of whites. At the local level as well, where the allocation of community resources is frequently decided, there is strong evidence for race-based voting. So what you'll see here is that these statistics in the academic literature are a little bit different from the ones in the Pew uh, research that was done, but they suggest a similar trend. The numbers are different. Here we get, uh, what is it, 80% rather than the 90% in that particular one. Um, but nonetheless, the trend still remains. So there is a racial divide in the United States about who people vote for. Um, if we know that, and that's demonstrable uh, through the data and through the statistics, and then if we try to think in a non-partisan manner, we try to think objectively, we try to think about what the political parties are doing or would be doing, if the Republican Party, for example, know that they get nothing of the black vote but the majority of the white vote, who would they... Um, tailor their message for. And conversely, if the Democratic Party, especially since the, the Civil Rights Act in the mid-1960s, which is said to have sort of split the parties before that, there might have been more overlap, but that was a, a divisive a divisive or a decisive moment in American politics. Which side are you on? Um, if the Democrats know that they're going to get that percentage of the votes, then they might also tailor their message in politics, you have to know your audience and you have to reach people and you have to speak to them. You have to uh, appeal to your party base if you want to win. Now, if politics is a game and there's two sides, they're going to do what they can to win, are they not? And this is not me condoning or uh, allowing any behavior on either sides. Um, but from what I see, if they were the, the options presented with the two parties, then they would... Uh, push that message forward. And it would be the same thing, say, in South Korea, where there is a gender divide amongst the um, the ruling Democratic Party and the conservative opposition party. Uh, it, it's not based on race or ethnicity in South Korea. It's more based on gender. You'll find more females uh, voting, especially young females, 
of course not all, but the statistics seem to show that there, a majority of them would vote for the uh, ruling Democratic Party. Now, if political parties know this, and they do the surveys and they look at those things, I'm sure they must sit in their offices and come up with plans. Well, we've got these people, or these people are gonna vote for us. They're always, that's our thing. So we need to try to get these uh, waving pe wavering people. This is our core base. These we're never gonna get. We need to try to get these people in the middle and keep these on side. I'm sure they must do that. I'm sure both the Republicans and the Democrats do that. And in England, the Conservative, the Labour, the Liberal Democrats, the uh, the SNP, uh, and the Dobolo Minju Dang, and the, whatever the Bosu Dang is called these days, most disrespect, they change their name a lot, Mire Tonghap Dang, something. Um, that's what they would do, isn't it? And so, do they exacerbate or do they... Uh, use situations to furnish their own political goals. Uh, the study continues. Is race really at the heart of this realignment? A significant number of studies suggest that it is one of the major forces at work. You can see the studies there. Uh, Carmines and Stimson conclude that the struggle over race at its peak, the dominant issue of American political life for only some three years in the mid-1960s, permanently rearranged the American party system. They claim that realignment was triggered by the ideological polarization of the two party caucuses in Congress after the election of 1958, which shifted the balance of power in each party away from the center. The exogenous pressure of the civil rights movement forced the parties to take positions on civil rights issues, positions that proved to be more distinctive than they had previously. So um, in South Korea, uh, to use this example, the uh, the North Korean policy might be the thing that sort of divides them. They, you might find agreement between the I say the right and left, but it's not really right and left as much between the Democrats and the Conservatives in South Korea. You might find that they both agree on um, government payments to people that are unemployed. They both they both might agree on. Um, whether to legalize or not to legalize gay marriage, they might agree on all these things. The one thing that they don't agree on, generally, is the, the Nambukwange or the North Korean policy. That's the one sort of thing that divides them, and it's hard to cross that. Of course, there are others, but that's a, that's a real one. Uh, and in America, what this article suggests in the United States, this article suggests that that three-year period over the civil rights movement in the mid-1960s, that divide there became the thing that separated uh, the two parties and, and, and kept uh, people divided. It was the polarization because the issue was brought to the public consciousness. It wasn't that that issue was not there before. It just people didn't talk about it or it became the, the silent thing. It, it just became uh, something that you could avoid. But then when it erupted into the streets and there were the protests and it had to be discussed, then when it was talked about, it became, well, what side are we going to go on? And that caused the division. <clears throat> they continue. Uh, the question, does race matter in American politics, is many facets. One place to begin our exploration is among the small minority of U.S. campaigns that involve non-white candidates. Does candidate race influence electoral outcomes? Like most questions concerning the impact of race in politics, this one is more difficult to answer than it seems at first. Black and white voters do seem to prefer candidates of their own race in biracial elections and, consequently, it is exceedingly rare for black candidates to be elected outside of majority-minority political jurisdictions. So it suggests here that if there's a white and a black, the whites are more likely to vote for the white and the blacks are more likely to vote for the blacks. Therefore... Um, there needs to be a majority of black voters for the black person to be elected, according to these studies. Cannon, for example, notes that in the 6,667 House elections in the white majority districts between 1966 and 1996, only 35, 0.52% were won by blacks. Similarly, Walton and Smith report that in the entire history of the country, only four blacks have ever served in the U.S. Senate, and only two since Reconstruction. But why does this pattern persist? 
persist. Does a candidate's race above and beyond characteristics such as party experience or ideology determine electoral success? Black candidates are not necessarily penalized by white simply because of their race, according to survey evidence drawn from actual campaigns. For example, when Tom Bradley ran for governor of California in 1982, racial criteria were no more predictive of white support for him than they were for other white Democratic candidates running for of other offices at the time. However, racial attitudes among whites do influence support for black candidates. Turkildsen criticizes survey-based attempts to answer this question because real-world candidates differ on so many dimensions. In an experimental study, she found sizable effects. Given two fictitious candidates described identically on dimensions other than race, white voters were more likely to support the one identified as white. Furthermore, dark-skinned candidates received even less support than similarly described light-skinned blacks. One lingering question, however, stems from the fact that we know voters use a candidate's race as an ideological cue. Let's just stop here before we do the next one. So they, this uh, study here uh, from Turkildzen in 1993 suggests that, yeah, people are more likely to vote for the person of a similar color to them. Um, but there's also differences or degrees uh, of the colour of the skin it goes into here and um, that also affects it. It's not just binary like that but there are degrees inside of that it's mentioned. One lingering question uh, however stems from the fact that we know voters use a candidate's race as an ideological cue such that black candidates are seen as more liberal than whites. Even given an identical description then, voters may assume that a black candidate will pursue more liberal policies once in office. If white voters prefer more conservative candidates, then the effect of candidate race may be explained by these inferred ideological differences and not by race alone. However, Turk, Turk Ildsen also demonstrates that self-monitoring reduces the impact of racial attitudes on evaluations of dark-skinned black candidates. One would not expect this pattern if preferences were being driven primarily by inferences about a candidate's non-racial ideological stance. Um, in these studies, it's suggesting that people vote for that which would they perceive in themselves, but there are also differences in terms of color. It's not binary. The other thing that this is suggesting is that we have unconscious assumptions about what position those people will take so it says here that um, black candidates are seen as more liberal than whites so if we see a black candidate we assume that they are going to be a more liberal candidate than the other one so if we have liberal tendencies that might override any racial tendencies so it's ideological let me explain that with a south korean perspective if you had two candidates that were put there and uh, one was from Daegu and one was from Gwangju and that was all you knew about them, you would probably assume that the one from Gwangju was progressive and the one from Daegu was more conservative. And that would be because of history, that would be because of media, that would be because of narrative. Now it might very well be true, but you would also assume that without knowing any of the facts. So there are these unconscious cues that come into us and if we see uh, African-American candidates or black candidates, then we might assume that they're going to be the more progressive one. And when we looked at the uh, voter turnout and which ethnicities vote for which parties, that would also perhaps be the case. It would be born out of that evidence that we know that it's a nine, uh, it's a 90% to 10% chance that yes, they are progressive. So in our head, that seems the logical thing to assume. To assess whether racial attitudes determine political preferences, one might begin by looking for differences between blacks and whites. If between race differences were small, then one might be skept skeptical of the claim that racial attitudes play a large role in policy preferences. But racial gaps in opinion are not small. Black-white differences of 35 to 50 percentage points exist in support for race-targeted policies, such as government guarantees of equal opportunity in employment, school desegregation, spending on programs to assist blacks and affirmative actions for blacks in hiring and college admissions. 
even on non-racial policies such as general government spending on social services, education and assistance for the poor, black-white differences of over 20% are typical. Finally, large differences emerge on values such as egalitarianism, the optimal size of government and the general fairness of the American political system. All of these disparities, disparities have persisted over time and easily exceed differences across gender, class and religion. So there are differences in gender, there are differences in class, there are differences in religion. This is the mid 90s, so it might be different because we know uh, it also suggested that race goes up and down. So it might be affected by when you do these studies or do these surveys, you get different results when people are when race has come to the forefront of the political conversation, when people are more race conscious or other times it might go down. I think you see similar trends in things like nationalism goes up and down and such forth, a bit like the economy. Um, but what this suggests is that there are differences uh, in things that are specific race related policies and also non race related policies. These differences between them in opinions remain. Of course, it's not like 100 percent. They're saying percentage points. It's on a spectrum. It's not all the, they all vote for this and they all vote for that. It's on a spectrum. But that spectrum seems to be according to what the studies suggest here, that it's consistent. It's consistent in the general thing. It's consistent also in specific policies related to race and it's also consistent in general policies related to the size of government, government's role, the social contract and such forth. Those differences remain and those differences are bigger than the differences in gender. Those differences are bigger than the differences in class and those differences are bigger than the differences in religion according to these studies. So it's a really important thing. It's a uh, political partisan divide. I they they were the results of of that first um, study. I'm I asked you to read uh, this one. This one has uh, by Sidney Verber, K. Lehman, uh, Scholzman, Henry Brady, and Norman H. Nye from 1993. Uh, it, it's quite a heavily cited paper. I've asked you to read this one. I won't go too much into it um, here, but let me uh, have a look at some of the things that they suggest. Um, because I want to talk about your final exam before I finish. So it's talking about whether people take full of advantage of the opportunity to participate in political life. It's not talking about the laws. So the 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 civil rights in the movements of the 1960s gave these laws. They were previously held down, as I said, by sort of Jim Crow movements and such forth, which restricted education and uh, literacy rates. But it, it's talking about not the legal process, but are the people taking the opportunity to participate in political life? This again itself is another question, because maybe participating in political life is just continuing the system that you want to bring down. You can see that there's a lot of movement for uh, defund the police or uh, break down the system. And you get that also we've we've studied in like Marxist ec economist views of capitalism. They also wanted, right, let's get the system down. We've got to overthrow it. You see that when you look at feminism, you get elements of that. We say this is a patriarchy. We've got to break the system down and overthrow it. And in this one as well, you also see elements of the system is racist. We've got to break this down and overthrow it. So these are these are common across all forms of uh, oppression, the oppressed and the oppressors, if that's the lens that one takes. Um, obviously, bonus points if you can recognize those two actors at the bottom. Yes, Antonio Banderas and Danny Trio. Um, this is an important point, I believe. Democracy rests on the fundamental idea of the equal consideration of the needs and preferences of each citizen. Political participation is the mechanism by which those needs and preferences are communicated to political decision makers and by which pressure is brought to bear on them to respond. Thus, equality in political participation embodied in the most obvious principle of equal consideration of citizen preferences one person, one vote, would seem to be a necessary condition for democracy. 
Of course, in no democracy, including the United States, are all citizens equally politically involved. The extent to which disparities in participation constitute a violation of the principle of equal protection of interests, however, rests upon two fundamental considerations. The extent to which those who are not involved differ in politically relevant ways from those who are, and the extent to which their abstention is the result of free and voluntary choice. Everybody has to vote, or you need to give everybody the chance to vote. But if some people aren't voting, why is that? Uh, it, is it they're not voting because they're just politically apathetic? They're just, you know, I'm done with it. It's all a load of games. It's a load of malarkey. It's a load of muddy, hot sorry, something like that. Not having it. Or is it because people are being restricted access to political behavior through, uh, and they break down some of these later in the study, through education, through um, through money, through groups that allow them the, uh, to develop the abilities to speak and to engage in discourse and to communicate. So is it, if you see disparities in people not voting, and there, there are disparities, we saw that, why is that? Is that through choice or is that through system, uh, systemic or systematic um, obstacles keeping them from not voting? Because if it's the second one, then that would be undermining democracy. That would be problematic. If they're, if they're just making a free choice not to vote, then perhaps it would be fine. But if there are obstacles to them not voting, then that would be uh, undermining democracy. If activists are representative of all citizens in terms of their preferences and needs for government action, it would matter little that some citizens take part and others do not. The participants could speak effectively for those who are more quiescent. When it comes to the groups in question here, however, it is well known that African Americans, Latinos and Anglo whites do differ in their attitudes on political matters, partisan affiliations, vote choice and needs for government policy. Hence, any divergences in their rates of activity are of political concern. So what we've learned, if you put this all together, is that uh, different people vote for different things and in um, the United States for example and we can't say that this is true all around the world you would have to look at the literature for each country and this even this is not a full comprehensive look at the literature I'm not suggesting it is we're just putting it there for discussion it suggests that uh, different ethnic groups or in this language used here the white and the blacks they have different preferences they vote for different people and on matters of race policies, different preferences. Non-race policies, different preferences. So they think differently. No, no, I think different. Well, they, they have different political wants. They have different political desires and different political needs. Okay, fine. And, but if they were both participating equally, then that would be democracy. That would be something working. But if they have different needs and in a democracy, not everybody votes, not everybody does something. We normally just let the people, you do it and you speak for me. And if you speak well, I'll give you my vote. That's how it works. That's how democracy works. We don't all go and make every decision. We elect somebody to make a decision for us because we're busy. We've got lives. We've got Netflix to watch. We've got papers to write. We've got uh, exams to do. So we elect someone. But if the people elected are never representing our desires, then there you can see that things might be problematic. Because the people that elected don't represent what we want, or they want, or these people want. They represent what some people want, granted. But how much of that is represented? Um, the number of political acts by ethnicity uh, race and ethnicity, they use, they explain their use of these terms. Uh, again, I understand that it might be problematic for some people. The number of political acts, and also they break it down because, you know, what does Latino mean or something? Again, you could break those down. These are very, I mean, if you consider the life of a, a, a Harvard uh, trust fund, I don't know what the words are, <laughs> a Harvard trust fund yuppie, that's a real kind of 80s cocaine and business type thing um that's a very different experience from someone that lives in maryland on the farm you know they're both white but they're both classed together uh, purely on that and you could say the same thing for uh 
the African American one. So they are very broad, very broad categories that can get broken down and broken down more and more. And uh, how much of that is essential? The data is there. The figures for contacting and protesting bear closer scrutiny. Although these are both forms of political involvement that permit the communication of clear messages to policymakers, they differ in significant ways. While a larger proportion of the public engages in contacting than protesting, contacting requires a higher level of communication skills than does attending a demonstration, a form of activity that was important to the American civil rights movement and that is often being considered to be the weapon of the weak. Compared to protests, contact with government officials permit the transmission of much more pre precise messages including concerns about how policies affect an individual. In addition, while protests may be used as a device to promote minority group solidarity, getting in touch with a public official may require a minority group member to cross a racial or ethnic barrier. Only 43% of the African-American contactors reported that the official they contacted was also African-American and 29% of the Latino contactors reported that the official they contacted was also of Latino origin. In contrast, 94% of the Anglo-Whites indicated that the official they contacted was an Anglo-White. The data in Figure 4, which showed a sharp contrast in the patterns for contacting and protesting, are consistent with these considerations, especially in relation to the comparison between African Americans and Anglo-Whites. The former are less likely to contact an official and more likely to protest than the latter. The differences are quite substantial, especially since overall levels of activity are quite similar between the two groups. The contrast in choice of activity may reflect the fact that African Americans are as politically mobilized and involved as the Anglo-White portion of the population, but have not received or do not perceive themselves to have received, it's gone off the page, uh, political representation, I guess it might say. Really important point here, that uh, contacting your officials and saying this is what we want and protesting are different forms of political activity. They're both political activity. One is writing a letter to your MP or, or, or contacting people. The other is going out in the street and, uh, and, and demonstrating, and protesting. They're both political activity. One of these acts requires a certain set of skills, communication skills, technology, emails, all of these kind of things. The other one requires a different set of skills. The, the other point, and they say that the uh, Anglo-Whites are far more likely to contact a politician to get something done, and the African-Americans in this study are far more likely to protest, but they have the same political engagement, they just express it differently. Now, one of the reasons they suggest that there might be systematic things that stop people contacting is also that there is no representation they would have to uh, cross a racial line, it says here, cross a racial or ethnic barrier. The people that feel oppressed, the minorities, might do protesting instead of contacting, because to contact the politicians, they're, they're contacting who they perceive perhaps as the enemy, because they want to change things politically, so they go to the politics, but then they see the person in charge is the person that they are protesting against. And that also makes a very big difference in all of this. It goes in to say, uh, because of time, I'm, I'm going to go through, but you can see the points that I've highlighted for you here. Uh, I'm not doing this because of any disinterest or trying to skip your attention from it, but I'm looking at the time. Uh, education uh, and money are important for these things. Um, bonus points if you know that movie. The article has shown that by standards of the second criterion, that our understanding of the meaning of gaps in participation hinges upon whether the inactive don't want to or can't participate. We have cause for concern as well. We have seen that differences among the three groups with respect to participation can be attributed almost entirely to the unequal political resources at their disposal rather than to rational abstention. So it's systemic rather than choice. That's the conclusion of this piece. Race and ethnicity matter fundamentally for participation in two different ways. First, some of the resources that we have found to be associated with political activity, most obviously language and religious domination and practice, uh, denomination and practice, are intimately connected to group identity. 
Differences in education, income and occupation associated with race and ethnicity that help to account for participatory differences do not define an ethnic group. Religion and language, however, are social attributes that go to the heart of the meaning of ethnicity. Moreover, race and ethnicity are suddenly germane to the consent of messages communicated to public officials through the medium of citizen activity. Members of minority groups who participate less are disproportionately poor, face discrimination in jobs and housing, or have difficulty communicating in English. Whether the disparities in participatory resources result from social class differences associated with race and ethnicity, or from attributes more fundamental to group identity, does not change the fact that policymakers are hearing less from groups with distinctive needs and concerns arising from their social class and group status. That's the conclusion of the piece. So where do you go from there? Well, I would spend more on this, but... Uh, Americans age 25 and older, Pew Research, Wall Street Journal. Americans age 25 and older with a bachelor degree or more, 2010. The Asians do very well. Oh, the, yeah. Median US household income, 2010. Yeah. Uh, percentage of Asian Americans with a bachelor degree or higher. So this becomes interesting. Is it all ethnic minorities some is it, how do you start pulling that apart because you see that some are succeeding now this is difficult where the conversation gets into um absolutely the papers that i've showed you demonstrate systemic problems and differences and political differences so they need to be addressed uh, I'm going to leave this here. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about any of this material, please feel free to contact me, put it in the discussion. I've already started reading some of those. Um, I'll just say a couple of things very quickly about the final exam, which will be this Friday. Um, like the midterm, there will be eight questions, probably eight questions. Please answer four. Some of you answered all eight last time. I don't know how you did that in three hours. Answer four questions. Even if there's nine, answer four. I mean, if there's 10 questions, answer four. Um, some of the questions will be specific, like to the materials that we've done, and some will be more broad and general. If you only use material from after midterm to answer your questions, great. So if you use week 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 to answer your questions, great. If you use after midterm and before midterm, great. If you only use before midterm, no. So I hope that's really clear to you. If you only use materials from after midterm, because I've tested you on the before, I've tested you on that. If you only use after midterm materials, that's great. If you use after, after midterm materials as your primary things and you back it up with some, you know, some stuff from the beginning, that's, that's great. That's really good. If you only use a lot of the stuff from before the midterm, that's not correct. That would be not acceptable so i hope you understand the differences between that um the last thing i'll say is that as this is the last lecture that i will give you um I, i'm really sorry that i feel that we've missed one of the most important uh, and i find most interesting and rewarding parts of the classes that i do at hanyang there is when we discuss things together in class and we we come together and we give people a voice and we realize, wow, people think differently from me and we need to talk about these things and see how we overcome them because that's really fundamental, I think, to learning and, and having those discussions when there are differences. It's a bit different online. You might have seen opinions on the discussion board or heard me say something, but when you're together, when you have the opportunity to discuss these things and realize sometimes, well, maybe I'm wrong or maybe they're wrong. How do we deal with this? Maybe we're both wrong. Those discussions are key. So I, I, I'm really sorry that we've missed a lot of them this semester. Um, I, I've done what I can with this new situation. Um, yeah. uh, I would suggest that going forward, if you need any help with resumes, job applications, being an exchange student, uh, cover letters, recommendations to get a job, please feel free to contact me. Uh, I will happily help do any of those things for you uh, I'm more than happy as part of my role 
Um, if you ever need any counseling or anything, you just want to say hello, again, feel free to contact me. I'm sure you've got my email or social media, anything like that. If there's anything else I can do to help you in your personal or academic career going forward, there's avenues you want to explore. You might know some of the things that I do in society and you want to try to get involved in those or, or do things. Sometimes nobody's going to come up to you and ask you. You have to take the bull by the horns. That's what life is. You have to be forward and proactive. If you're, if you're doing that, you want help or you know how to contact me. And for the most part, I'll, I'll certainly do what I can. For now, uh, thank you. Um, Best of luck with everything. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay positive. Uh, I hope to, if you see me on campus, when we go back, uh, please come and say hello to me so I can see your face. Um, and for the last time, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye.